Welcome everybody to Gardening, Preserving, and Learning, a 25-minute show keeping you in the know. I'm your host, Joy Baird. This show is presented to you by the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and by Canning What You Grow. As we go in the kitchen each week, Holly shows us from the very basics to the advanced levels of canning so we all can can more of what we grow. We travel up to central Pennsylvania today to speak with an individual who may have grown up a little differently than what you have experienced. He had an Amish mother and a Mennonite father. He spent most of his time in the garden with his mother and foraging in the forest and hunting and fishing with his father. He gardens by the Bible and we're going to ask him why he does that. He's got a lot of wealth of information. I want to welcome to the program. He has his own YouTube channel under the same name and that will be placed in the show notes following the live broadcast. Mr. John Parker, welcome to the program. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Very, very uh, welcome there. Well, let's talk about your upbringing. You're in central Pennsylvania. Uh, things, you know, it's kind of like Amish country, I'm assuming. Is that the correct term that people would use for that area? I'm sorry you're uh, breaking up on me again. Uh, you live in central... Could you ask me that yeah. question again? Yeah, you live in central Pennsylvania. Would that be considered Amish country for the rest of the folks who may not be familiar? Uh, well, technically it's old order Mennonite country. Uh, uh, there's a history, and one of my videos covers it. Uh, Menno Simons broke away from the uh, uh, Catholic Church, and he was the actual reformer, and then... Uh, what the Mennonite Amish people call uh, was uh, uh, Jacob Ami, uh, or some of the his. If you look it up on the internet, they'll call him Jacob Ammon. But the Men Amish people call him Jacob Ami. Broke away from Menno Simon's group and started the Amish. Uh, east of here in Snyder County, I'm in Snyder County. Uh, in the east end of the county, there's a large settlement of Amish, which are there are several kinds of Amish. These are the white buggies. They call them white toppers. And uh, those are my mom's people. They're called, or Nebraska Amish. But right around me, uh, right in this area, the buggies and the people that uh, I live am amongst are my father's people. They're old water Mennonites. Now, growing up as a youngster, was you involved when was the first time you saw an automobile being a Mennonite Amish uh, horse and buggy when was the first time you really f was familiar with what an automobile was well my 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 grandfather in his spring wagon coming back from a, a mill the feed mill in 1948 and was killed by a truck driver that went to sleep uh, there were some church problems, and my my family ended up leaving the Amish church. So I was born in, into a modern, more like modern Mennonite family. We had cars. I just grew up with an outhouse and a hand pump. I mean, we were some. My parents didn't transition well out of out of that particular lifestyle. I understand. So, you know, for those who journey over to look at your YouTube videos, you have a very, very elaborate and beautiful garden that you spend pretty much your days in the summer in. Talk about, you. I think you have two or three gardens. Talk about some of the enjoyable things that you grow in your garden. You ask me some of the things I grow. Uh, well, I grow, uh, we have, uh, well, you've seen, my, probably if you watch my videos, you see we have, I have some heirloom things, things that have been handed down through the faith. Uh, we have uh, what the Amish call black root. Uh, it's a comfrey, and they use that to make a polis to treat uh, men's skin and bone. Uh, there's a lot of remedies uh, amongst the old order people. Uh, I have the sweet potatoes that my mom uh, 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 has handed to me or handed down to me. Uh, things like that, we uh, just save and, and pass it on until somebody decides that they don't want to do it anymore. But uh, 
I mean, uh, pretty much what I do on my videos, I I do just the way my mom did. I do see stuff on the internet on YouTube, particular particularly, and uh, I try it. But you know what? I almost always go back to doing it the way I grew up because it just seems to work. And it might be because I have more experience at doing it that way, or it 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 worked for them for hundreds of years. So I don't know. Right. Yeah. It, the old way may not be the modern way, but it's the way that works the best. Well, and it's it's a. I find that when I look at people's gardens across the the country on YouTube, everyone has a different set of circumstances, and you can look at my videos and say, "Oh," and I get these comments where. I want a garden like yours, but what works for me here in the ground I have and in the climate I have and the zone I'm in, uh, it's not going to work the same way. I mean, uh, for example, lettuce and, and, and uh, turnips and uh, a lot of the, uh, the, the cool crops are not going to do nearly well in a uh, climate in the south as they do here and there's things that people can grow north of here that do better there than they do here so I mean it's a it, one of the things in gardening you have to learn to do is is find what works in your area in your soil and adapt and and then when you find something that works stick with it Absolutely. Just because some, you see somebody grow an avocado tree in Florida doesn't mean it will grow in central Pennsylvania or Wisconsin. Now we're we're talking in the middle of October, and uh, you know we've grown vegetables all summer long. You have a great video on how you cure your vegetables, mainly talking about the spaghetti squash, the butternut squash, the sweet potatoes. Talk about how you were taught to cure those vegetables that will allow them to stay as fresh as they can all winter long. I'm having a difficult time hearing you, but I think yes, how I cured the vegetable, how I cured my squash. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, well, I have a I have a bedroom. I live in a mobile home. I guess you can see that uh, in the background here. Uh, and uh, I have one whole, well, actually two whole bedrooms that are dedicated to uh, basically being our basement and uh, and uh, and food storage. And I have some can in the back room. It's not heated. And uh, I have my uh, I have paper laid out on the floor as I do uh, here in the living room. Uh, also, and uh, uh, ran out of space back there, so. Uh, uh, I have a paper on the floor, and I have uh, the individual squash laid out. Uh, you want to leave the stems on uh, um, two to three inches, unless they're Hubbard, Hubbard squash. And the reason you want to do that is uh, most squash, winter squash, have a somewhat fragile shell. And when you snap that top off, it'll crack the shell and that's where you'll start to have decay. Uh, Hubbard squash have such a hard rind that it doesn't hurt the shell and you don't get the break in it so you can actually uh, store Hubbard squash that way. And unfortunately I, Hubbard squash is one of the best squash you can grow for a winter squash. It keeps very well. But uh, with the onset of these new stink bugs and some of the pests that we have here in our area, and I, I'm hearing that it's all over our country now. Uh, they uh, they just the 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 uh, bugs love the Hubbard squash, and they actually use Hubbard squash to plant. You plant to pull the insects pest away from your other squash and they'll attack the Hubbard squash and it's a diversion that you you still you'll get something you just don't get the best <laughs> interesting I had not heard that 
and that's uh, advice that uh, gardeners from all over the country can take. Uh, you take one good vegetable and use it as a bug deterrent so your other vegetables uh, will grow better. Now I want to ask you about bees. You're very adamant about bees. You, you talk in your videos about bees. How many hives are you running and are you extracting a lot of honey or are you just learning the whole process about bees and honey and that whole, whole uh, gamut there? Well, uh, I don't extract honey. I leave the honey for the bees. Uh, I, I saw you had a post up the other day and uh, I'm very concerned about the bees. Uh, and their well-being. It's just the love. I love, uh, if you watch my videos, almost every one, you'll see me out watching the bees. Uh, it, it's always been a fascination with for me, and over the years I've had hives, and uh, I'm more, and I'm type 1 diabetic, so I can't eat honey. I mean, I'll eat a spoon once in a while, my blood sugar goes low, but uh, I do it basically for pollination. And, and for the sake of the bees because uh, and I don't do a lot of interfering with the bees because the more genetic turnovers that happen the better they are going to overcome uh, stopping swarming and uh, and trying to use them as a farm animal is actually hurting the cause of the bees and and basically for me I have my orchard up on the hill here and uh, my fruit this year with these this this batch of bees uh, uh, has just been phenomenal. The sets I've had, and anybody that's seen the video of the pear trees and the apple tree know that I had a really good heart, a set of fruit this year, and it's because of the uh, of having the pollinators. Absolutely, we've uh, watched several of your videos regarding bees. Now, the question that I or the the that I posed in the intro, you garden by the Bible. Now there's people that are watching this or that are very religious, believe in God, maybe more than you and I combined. There's other people that don't believe in God or not a religious person. Why in your mind did you decide and would encourage others to at least attempt to garden by the way the Bible says to? Uh, I think I heard you say that. How does the Bible? How does the Bible uh, 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 incorporate into my uh, into my gardening? Uh, well, I, I first of all, I, I think uh, talking. You, you start in the book of Genesis in the second chapter. Uh, according to the, the 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 scripture, human history began in a garden, and uh, you know, I mean, throughout the Bible whether you believe in the Bible or not, you're going to find that the Bible makes more reference to gardening and agronomy or agriculture than any other any other single uh, what's the adjective I want to use any other single item to make use as an illustration uh, it, you know I mean in, in uh, John's Gospel uh, then then the 19th chapter where did you find Jesus you found him in the garden Judas takes the the the, uh, the Sanhedrin there to find him because as it says he Judas knew he often went to the garden you know I mean that Jesus went to and a garden is a uh, the garden I believe of Eden was a beautiful place and I think I think uh, the thing about a garden and what I see, uh, and uh, uh, before I go to that point is, and Jesus ends up being buried, or Yeshua, whatever you want to call him, you know, uh, 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 was buried in a garden. You you find beginning, and and throughout the Bible mentions of gardening or illustrations to gardening. Uh, a sower went forth and sowed. You know, it talks about that some fell in the, the wayside. It, and there's so many lessons that when you're out in the garden, and you just if you just do nothing more than to read the scripture and say, I wonder how this could help me or how it applies to what, what I learned to do or what I can do to make things happen. 
and it said some fell on the way, way, the way, and it was hard. It was the roadway, and it never, never began to grow because there was, there was no, there was none of the basic elements for, for growth. There was not depth of soil. There was no moisture. There was excessive heat. You know, uh, all the things you need to make things grow are limited. So what? What? How can that work for me? Well, when I pull my weeds, and I can't get them, take them out. I, I put them in the, I put, put them in the pathway where I'm tramping on them and I'm tramping on them. I, I do what my chickens do if I, uh, you know, instead of if I can't get them. And when you have one leg, you know, you don't go in and out of the garden. Special life calls it the jungle. She says she's afraid to go in it because we have groundhogs, and she's terrified by the ground. She went in the garden one time, and there, she said there was one standing up there looking at her, and she was, I mean, she's just terrified. Well, and then I got some great big monster, monster spiders, and, uh, and I, you know, you're going to find that I, uh, I, now the groundhog, that's on a different set of uh, terms, groundhogs and squirrels, uh, if I can get them, they're they're somewhere else, you know. But uh, but the spiders and uh, the snakes and the things like that, I uh, I pretty much let them. I go in slow, and uh, there are people that come to my garden. I uh, a lot of people come here and get stuff. I give a lot of stuff away, and uh, they're terrified by all the bees because there are bees, big bees, little bees all kinds of bees in my garden and I plant stuff just for bees I mean that that's uh, specifically targeting the bees and the pollinators and uh, they get terrified when they see all this but I walk right through it and they don't bother me when you go hammering on their home or tramping on it or something like that that's when they're going to become uh, I, I'll be honest with you uh, I think I was stung two times this year and uh, yeah, it was two times this year, the, and that was by my bees in the hive, and uh, they were, uh, they were, uh, I had pinched them, and I was in a hive suit. The, when I take care of my bees without a hive suit, I didn't get stung at all. So uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I got off on something, and I don't know how, what I got off on. <laughs> Very, very good information regarding the Bible and gardening. Let's turn to another aspect. It's getting to become winter. I watched your video the other day of you maintaining your wood stove. Now, watching that brought me back uh, memories of living back on the old homestead. Talk about some of the very important reasons why those who have fireplaces should really maintain them before bad things can happen to you. Oh, my, yes. I'll tell you what. Uh, I've... Uh, I, I volunteered for a fire company for a little while, and uh, when it says, you know, first of all, when you uh, don't take for granted that uh, that uh, that things are are safe just because it has a UL writing on it, you need to follow. If it says 18 inches from the wall, they 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 don't want to be sued, and I've seen where houses were on fire. And they had the chimney going up four inches from the wall. Well, you know, yeah, that might work until you get a fire. You know, you didn't clean your stack. And and I I'm pretty a uh, little paranoid about uh, keeping things cleaned out. I mean, I I tear my stove apart. The complete the stove in here, right beside me here, and it's burning right now. It's 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 raining and it's cold here. And I built fire today. I have a fire in the furnace for the green or the wood stove for the greenhouse and I have one in here and uh, and, uh, and it's burning beside me right here right now but I uh, I religiously and I emphasize I religiously tear this thing apart at least once a month and when I feel the damper on the stack get a little tight it doesn't have to be a month I take that out and I brush that pipe and Every two weeks, I have a Saturday a Saturday morning chore. Get up, take care of the chicken and ducks. Then, uh, you know, take care of the greenhouse, and then it's go back and clean the chimney. 
You know, it only takes uh, two or three minutes to open that thing, run the brush up, and uh, you know what? It's worth it to be able to go to bed at night and uh, and to be able to sleep and not know not know that that you know that things could go horribly wrong. And you know, things can go horribly wrong for no fault. Of course, I mean, you know, a, a weld could break. I mean, this this thing was made in China. And we know how wonderful some of the stuff made in China is, you know. Uh, it's hard to find really well-made products anymore. Durable goods, is it what it used to be? Uh, now, they over across the hill here, one of my relatives do, do sell cook stoves, but in a trailer, I, I can't use it. I had one before. It's called a Pioneer Made. And I tell you what, if you're serious about homesteading, it's a... It's a uh, it's it's something you'll hand down to your kids. It's durable. You can buy it in your 20s, and uh, it's made to be repaired, but it's made by people who look for durability. And uh, it's made in Canada. It's called Pioneer Made. Uh, and they have some cheaper models, but they're still pretty they're, – they're not for less than $400. Let's put it that way. <laughs> right. Well, you, you mentioned about your greenhouse. Uh, let's talk about the greenhouse a little bit. You've got a hydroponic system set up there. You've got some stuff growing in there. Now, are you familiar or are you learning the hydroponic world? Or is that just something you tinker with to see what you can make happen and grow in it? Well, that, that's a, 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 a project that, uh, I mean, when it comes to growing things, uh, if you, uh, I'm not real good with the computer, and then most of you probably, if you watch my videos, know that I never used the camera until, like, in June. I mean, uh, I didn't. Uh, I I tried for two years and couldn't figure it out. And here, uh, I I finally got somebody to help me, and they told me that it wasn't that the camera's a good camera, but the the computer is a newer computer and it requires a firewire. I mean, I am so backwards when it comes to this stuff. Then it took me probably a month to figure out how to, to put it up, you know. And uh, I, I'm the type of person you have to show. But I, I have on my favorites list over here, I have all kinds of things where I like to, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I grew up, is the child air layering things? Uh, my dad worked in the orch in a, a very large orchard, and fruit trees were a big interest of his, and and grafting and things like that. And and uh, and this is just I don't know when it comes to growing things, propagating things. Uh, I don't know. I think it has. I, I I believe every human has this intrinsic desire to. To uh, be uh, to garden to I don't know I, I know the Genesis says we were made out of the uh, the dust of the earth out of clay or and it, we and and we're going to go back to it one of these days and I, somehow it, it just seems natural to want to work in the dirt and to make things grow uh, actually uh, before people have said. Uh, well, we wouldn't have to work if it wasn't for Adam's sin, but if you read in Genesis, the second chapter, you'll find that before Adam ever had had done the fall, it says he was put in there. He was to be a keeper of the garden. And uh, and I think that intrinsically is in our genes, is to, to uh, at least it is in mine, and uh, and I know there's a lot of people from what I see on the internet trying to learn how to do what I was raised doing. Absolutely. What? Oh, and getting back to the hydroponics, it's just an interest. Okay. All right. Well, John, I greatly appreciate you taking time out of your day to to join me on the program and showing sharing your wealth and knowledge about gardening the uh, gardening by the Bible and you know your interest in homesteading and just being you know fruitful and, and taking what you need from the earth and not having to buy it and, and making it more important to us as stewards of the earth and not just you know let's buy it because we want it let's you know let's grow it because we want it
And you can't beat going out to the garden and picking your stuff for breakfast and going out and picking it for dinner, going out and picking it for supper, and having it within minutes of the time it came off. And I have to say I feel so sorry. I, I lament the fact that anybody that has go, has had to has never had a peach or an apple or a pear that has actually been ripened or a strawberry even. I mean people that get everything from the grocery store, it's picked long before it should be picked for shipping. And that piece of fruit will never get to the, uh, the plate. I, I, it grieves me for people that don't know what a good piece of fruit tastes like. I, I mean, it just, well, it's, it's heart-wrenching when you go to the grocery store. If you go, I mean, we almost never go, uh, and you touch a piece of fruit and it's like a rock. A, a fruit, when it's picked off the tree, should not be hard. It should be, it should be, uh, a little bit like you want your avocados when you go to the store to get them. Absolutely. Well, thank you, John, for being on the program. For those of you who want to see more of John's videos, I will have that link of his YouTube channel in the show notes following the live broadcast. Until next time, that's John Parker in Central Pennsylvania. I'm Joy Baird from the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com reminding you to stay in the know so you're always prepared. See you next time, everybody.